Later termination of employment, dated January 8, 2011, is in breach of contract of service. It's totally misleading, considering the evidence that is before the court. Council argued that the relevant document that will determine whether or not the claimant was entitled to one month salary in lieu of notice is principally exhibit CW1001. <laughs> Council reproduced the relevant portion of the period of notice as contained in exhibit CW1001 and argued that from the terms of contract of employment, Contained in exhibit CW1001, the German question may quickly call for answers are as follows. The claimant still on probation, one was is terminated. There is the evidence before the claimant's employment was confirmed for determination, the thereby one more salary in lieu of notice. Council submitted that it is tried principle of law of evidence that he who has sat must prove. He cited the case of Owena Mass Transportation Company Limited against O'Connor. Council argues that the claimant deposed in paragraph 9 of claimant's statement on O filed on 20th day of November 2019 that his employment was confirmed after three months, but this was, def was de vehemently denied by the defender in paragraph 7 of defendant's statement on O filed on the 23rd day of October 2019. Who did the case and put the claimant? The strictest proof of same, but the claimant, both in his reply pleadings and oral evidence in court, could not prove yeah. that his employment was confirmed. As he contended that no further <laughs> bond the claimant's appointment that his employment was confirmed during cross examination. CW1 was asked if he was just anything before this court to show that his employment was confirmed. He answered yes, no document to that effect. Council argued that by this piece of evidence, the claimant has smoothly failed to prove that his employment with that defendant was confirmed, in line with the letter of employment, to be entitled to one more salary in lieu of notice. He said the law is right that terms of an agreement are determined by parties and not by court. Council submitted that without addition or subtraction to the terms of exhibit CW1001, the claimant can only be entitled to one more salary in lieu of notice upon confirmation of his employment. And since there is no evidence of confirmation of the employment, no breach was occasioned by the issuance of exhibit CW1002 and has urged this honorable court to hold. The council further contended that the claimant was served with exhibit DW1001 with the annexure exhibit DW001A, end of service statement on the 15th day of February 2011, as stated in exhibit CW1002, considering reliefs one, two, and three of the claimant's claim, the claimant also anticipated XBD W001A by virtue of paragraph two in XBD CW1002. Say so this is because 15th day of February 2011 was copiously referred to in XBD CW1002 to determine the claimant's faith whether he was entitled to terminal benefits. Accordingly, XBD W1001 and DW1001A were issued as serve on the claimant on the claimant on the 15th day of February 2011. Unfortunately, the claimant was inducted to the employer, hence no entitlement. Therefore, the claimant's denial of receipt of XB DW1001 <coughs> and DW1001A is not tenably low. Council submitted that a very German question is, what is the basis of the claimant's claim of payment of damages from 15th February 2011? This poza is effectively answered in paragraph two of exhibit CW1002, which provides your terminal entitlements are indebtedness pro to the bank will be communicated to you on or before February 2011. Council argued that exhibit DW1001 and DW1001A are, are, are means employed by the third defendant to communicate to the claimant to determine his terminal entitlements or indebtedness as anticipated <clears throat> by the claimant upon the receipt of exhibit CW1002. Said the contents of exhibit CW1002 are clear and unambiguous. The claimant was to be communicated his faith and not payment of entitlement on 15th day of February 2011. Council submitted that courts are enjoined to give literary meaning to words containing document when same were unambiguous. He cited the case of uh, ITF Governing Council against Low Energy River Basin and Rural Development 
authority in law and urge this honorable court to interpret the contents of expert W1001. Council submitted that the claimant has failed to establish any breach of contract of employment between the claimant and third defendant, formerly the second defendant, against any of the defendants and urge this honorable court to hold and resolve C1 in favor of the defendants against the claimant. On the second issue, whether the claimant has placed a sufficient evidence to be entitled to relief thought in this case against the defendants jointly and severally, Council adopted all submission in C1 and further submitted that the claimant has not placed sufficient evidence to be entitled to the relief claim as it is a tried principle of law that a party who seeks for declaration that the termination of his employment was wrongful must establish in court the conditions of service and non-compliance with the terms of conditions of service with the terms of conditions of employment. <clears throat> he placed reliance in the cases of Organ and others, again, Nigeria, liquefied natural gas and another, and also University of Calabar against Essia. Council submitted that a critical look at claimant's evidence shows that the conditions of service contract between the claimant and third defendant is to the effect that the claimant was only entitled to a month's salary lieu of notice of confirmation of his employment. Therefore, the cardinal requirement the claimant's pleading that his employment was confirmed ought to have been supported by adducing credible evidence. And fellow on the part of the claimant is fatal to his case, cited the case of Akim Baidi and another against Baba Tundi and others. Landed Council reproduced the three declaratory reliefs sought by the claimant from this honorable court and also an argue that the claimant is in one breath a relapse one and two six benefit from letter of termination of employment dated 8 February 2011, but in another breath, a relief, six, relief four seek to nullify letter of termination of employment dated 8 February 2011. Council argued that a party cannot be allowed to approbate and reprobate at the same time on the same issue, and a party is only prescribed from benefiting from a void or nullified act. Cited the case of Dr. Atiku Adorompi and others against Alaja Shobalaji Elera. Council argued that the claimant in paragraph 19 of his witness statement on oath that he suffered financial hardship and embarrassment as a result of the refusal of the defendant to pay him one month salary in lieu of notice since February 15, 2011. The question is Was there any promise or agreement between the defendants and the claimant where the claimant was to be paid one month salary in lieu of notice? on the 15th day of February 2011. Obviously, no such agreement was pleaded and adduced in evidence. Council contend that the claimant's failure to lead evidence to establish the declaratory relief is very fatal and renders no gateway all the declaratory reliefs. On the respect of relief 3A, Council argued that the claimant also failed to plead or lead evidence to show how he arrived at the sum of 53,000 naira as his one month salary from the breakdown of the claimant's amendment there is no way I stated that the claimant was entitled to 53,173.42 kobo as his one month salary. He said, the law is that special damages must be specifically pleaded and proved before a party seeking same can be entitled to such damages. Cited the case of Ozwe against Ezeo Puta. Council submitted that with respect to relief 3B and C, the claimant cannot be entitled to such reliefs because there is no evidence before the court how he reasonably suffered damages of 10 million naira in connection to the purported breach of contract of employment. And there is no one exhibit CW001 that speculates 23% or 10% interest of such breach. To rely on the case of Agu and General Oil Limited, Agu against General Oil Limited. <laughs> Council of the Sonoma Court to resolve the second issue in favor of the defendant against the claimant. In conclusion, Council argued that our dishonorable court to dismiss the entire claims of the claimant for being meritorious, frivolous, and merely gold digging. Council to the claimant also formulated two issues for determination in his final written address. That is whether in view of the totality of evidence adduced in this case before this honorable court, the defendants are either jointly or individually liable in breach of the contract of employment between the claimant and the third defendant, formerly the second defendant. And secondly, whether the claimant has placed sufficient evidence to be entitled to relief thought in this case against the defendant jointly and severally. Council submitted that the two issues above can be collapsed into one, which is whether the claimant is entitled to his claims in this suit. In arguing the issue for determination, Council argued that the defendants in their written final return just submitted that the contract of employment 
was between the second defendant, which according to them, it opposed into the third defendant and the claimant. The argument of the defendant that the first defendant is not privy to the contract and therefore cannot be bound by it is misconceived. Learned counsel argue that a careful study of the letter of employment, that is exhibit CW001A, the contract of employment, that is exhibit CW001B, and the letter of termination of employment, exhibit CW002, shows the fingerprints of the second defendant all over the place. Lanard Council alerted all the areas where the first defendant's name was mentioned in the above mentioned exhibits and contended that it is clear that the first defendant is the actual employer of the claim. After specifically mentioning the first defendant, Fidelity Bank PLC, in paragraph three of the letter of employment, under exhibit CW001B, it was stated under the headings, remuneration, and period of notice, respectively, that the bank would pay salary. It is a common knowledge of which this honorable court can take judicial notice, pursuant to section 122 IM of Evidence Act 2011, the salary is usually paid to the employee by the employer. Council contend that the only inference that can be drawn from the foregoing is that what transpired between the parties in this suit was an agency relationship. The first defendant is the actual employer who engaged the second and third defendant as his agent to recruit the claimant for employment. Council referred this court to exhibit CW001A, CW001B, CW002, and exhibit DW001. And the evidence of DW1 on the 13th, on the third day of December 2020, when he admitted during cross examination, that the first defendant related with the claimant based on exhibit CW001B, which is a contract of employment. Council submitted that the immutable principle of law, as it relates to agency, is that who is that he who acts through an agent equally acts by himself. He cited the case of Essang against Aero Plastic Limited and another. Therefore, the contention by the defendants that the first defender is not privy to the contract of employment is unsustainable from the contents of exhibit CW001A, CW001B, CW002, and DW001. It is clear that the first defendant was the actual employer, employer paying salary to the claimant and it will be unfair and unjust for the first defendant to deny liability for pay, failing to pay the claimants his one month salary in lieu of notice. Council urged this one the court to hold that the defendants are jointly and severally liable to the claimant for failing, neglecting to pay him one month salary in lieu of notice upon termination of his contract of employment. And he relied on the case of Mr. Morrison, who pay against Integrated Service Limited and all. In response to the submission contained in the defendant's final written address in pages 7, 8, and 9, and 10, where the defendant's counsel contained that the claimant's employment was not confirmed and that exhibit CW002 did not breach the terms of contract of employment is false. Counsel submitted that at paragraph 9 of his amended statement of facts establishing the cause of action and paragraph 9 of witness statement of both, both filed on 11 December 2019. The claimant pleaded and gave own challenge evidence that his employment was later confirmed and paragraph seven of the defendant's statement on oath filed on the 23rd day of October 2020 does not in any way controvert the evidence of the claimant that his employment was later confirmed by the defendant. That is his strife law that general traverse is not an effective way of denying any allegation of fact containing pleadings. There must be specific denial of the material fact alleged. Council submitted that the claimant during cross examination on the 11th day of March 2020 stated that his employment was confirmed, though there is no document showing that he was confirmed. However, with the leave of the court, he went ahead to explain how his employment was later confirmed. However, with the leave of court, he went ahead to explain how his employment was confirmed by the first defender. He said that he was sent for training induction in Lagos and that it was after the training that his employment was confirmed. And this piece of evidence was never challenged by the defendants. Leonard Council was just one of the told that the employment was confirmed. And And as such, the claimant is entitled to one month salary in lieu of notice upon termination of his employment. 
The defendant counsel in their final written address argued that the letter of termination of employment, XBCW001B, did not breach the contract of employment. The CW001B is false. Counsel argues that paragraph two of XBCW001B reads in part thus, a line whose contract of service will be paid one month basic salary in lieu of notice, unquote. And in XBCW001B, under the heading period of notice reads part thus, mm -hmm that the bank undertakes to give a minimum of one month notice, one month notice, in lieu of notice. And in exhibit CW001B, under the heading period of notice, read thus, the bank undertakes to give a maximum of one month notice of any termination of employment, or will pay a lieu thereof. And the position of the law that what governs every master server relationship such as one between the defendants and the claimant, is the contract of employment. He cited Shuaibu against Union Bank of Nigeria, PLC. Defendants counsel argue that in his final written address at page 10 and 11, that the claimant was not entitled to a month salary because exhibit DW001 and DW001A shows that the claimant was indebted to the employer but throughout the pleading and evidence, the claimant has maintained that he was never served with exhibits TW001 and DW001A during cross examination on the third day of December 2020. GW admitted that there was no endorsement on exhibit DW001 showing that the claimant received it and no place on exhibit DW001. DW001 showed that the claimant acknowledged receipt on paragraph six, which states kindly acknowledge receipt. In civil cases, a party proved his case on preponderance of evidence or balance of probability. And so the burden of proving any material fact lies on the party who alleged. He cited the case of a court against Julian Hyman. Lanet counsel contended that the defendants failed to produce any evidence, whether documentary or otherwise. Say that the documents were served on the claim. Counsel, as this honorable court, told that the defendants are jointly and severally liable to the claimant for failure to pay him his one month salary in lieu of notice, no furnish him with information about his purported indebtedness or otherwise to the bank on or before the 15th day of February 2011, as contained in paragraph two of letter of termination of appointment and exhibit DW001 and DW001 irrespectively amounts to an afterthought bereft of any probative value. And counsel like in C2 contended that the claimant is not entitled to his claim because the claimant did not plead sufficient evidence before the strong court and cited organ and others against nullified natural gas and another among others. He said the common ground of all the authorities cited by the defendant is that a claimant who seek a declaration that the determination of his employment was contrary to the contract of service must prove to the court that there is a contract of employment between him and the defendant. And the contract of employment was breached, including the way and manner of the breach. The Landed Council submitted that his argument is untenable on the ground that the claimant plead exhibit CW001 and CW001B, which are duly admitted by the court on the requirement that the claimant must show the particular term of contract of employment that was breached. Council the parties of the court, paragraph 14 of the amended statement of facts, establishing the course of action filed on the 11th day of December 2019, as well as paragraph 3A and 4B of reply to defendants amended joint statement of defense filed on 23rd day of January 2020. Council submitted that the, input the important question now begging for the defendants to answer as follows, whether the employment of the claimant was confirmed whether the termination of the claimant's employment complied with the requirement of exhibit CW001B. On the first question, counsel contend that the claimant had pleaded and laid evidence that his employment was confirmed and this piece of evidence was never challenged or controverted by the defendants. And the law is clear concerning unchallenged evidence, which is a case of Amau against Amoku. On the second question, whether the termination of employment was done in compliance with the contract of service, and submitted that the defendant pleaded and led credible evidence that the termination of his employment was in breach of his contract of employment. He referred this honorable court to paragraph 13, 14, and 15 of the amended statement of facts 
file on 11 December 2019, which were equally replicated seriatim in the company witness statement. In pages 15 and 16 of defendant's final written address, the defendant questioned how the claim arrived at figure, the figure 53,173.42 as his one month salary. In reply, counsel contended that in the contract of employment under the heading remuneration, it was stated in the earlier clause salary will be paid at the rate of 638 naira Ethiopian kawo per annum. We have 12 months in the year. I'm determined the claim of one month salary divides 638.081 by 12, and one will get 53,173.42. It was for the fact this quarter, the salary breakdown in exhibit CW001. Pendant counsel also in page 13 and 14, and I give relief one and two and four. The response counsel submitted that the relief thought, particularly one and two, are not premised on the propriety of letter of termination. But on the ground that the defendants by exhibit CW002 as paragraph two stated on or before the 15th day of February 2011, they were going to pay him his one month salary, his one month basic salary. The claimant seek redress for the injury he has suffered as a result of failure of the defendants to pay him his one month salary, lay of notice upon termination of his employment. Thus, really, four becomes more and less academic. If the courts find that the claimant is entitled to one month salary, lay of notice, and the claimant is not seeking for a statement. Counsel is therefore was rose relief number 14, and accordingly urged this honorable court to strike it out. In conclusion, counsel has this court to hold that the claimant has proved his case beyond the balance of probability, and also urged this honorable court to invoke its inherent powers in matters in this nature to award former punitive damages outside the ones claimed by the claimant, so as to serve as deterrent to some employers who cash in in helpless situation in our economy to, to exploit Nigerian youth such as the claimant. In response to the submission of the claimant's counsel in his final written address, counsel to defendant file a reply on points of law dated 8th day of February 2011 and file on the 16th day of February 2011. Counsel in response to the submission in paragraph 1.10 of the claimant's final written address argued that the law absolutely prescribed or forbids misstatement of facts in the final written address is a calculated attempt to wing the court started the case of Chevron Nigeria Limited against Titan Energy Limited. Council submitted that, contrary to the facts stated by the claimant in paragraph 1.10 of the claimant's final written address, it is pertinent to put the record straight that the claimant neither pleaded nor gave evidence on how and where or actual practice of confirmation of case dependent. Claimant only stated during cross-examination that he has no document to produce to prove his assertion that his employment was confirmed. In response to the submissions in paragraph 8.4 and 3.5 of the claimant's final written address, counsel submitted that words or clauses in a document are not interpreted in isolation, but must be construed at the whole, cited or quoted against a foyer. Counsel argued that counsel to the claimant has reproduced part of exhibit CW100, letter of employment dated December 4, 2007, and exhibit CW1002, letter of employment dated February 8, 2011. Council submitted that the claimant's emphasis a complete misplacement and isolated interpretation. The law is that where there is a condition present to the performance of any obligation under a contract, the obligation only crystallizes upon the existence or fulfillment of such conditions, citing the Java Local Government Council against Chigozi and others. Council submitted that the issue of one month salary or termination of employment will be employment or will pay salary in lieu thereof in the extract from exhibit CW001 only crystallizes in favor of the claimant upon confirmation of employment. Therefore, it is not automatic as the claimant must evidentially prove his assertion that his employment was confirmed, which he failed to do so. And in response to paragraphs 3.6, 3.7, 3.8, and 3.9 of the claimant's final written address, to strike law that the claimants must only succeed on the strength of its case and not on the weakness of the defendant's defense. Cited of Wale against Williams, to be hopes on the claimant to prove the assertion that the employment was confirmed, but this burden was never challenged by the claimant. Counsel response to submissions in paragraph, it may set paragraphs of the claimant's final written address submitted that the strike principle of law, that documentation is the hallmark of banking, is cited the case of Senate Trust Bank Limited against Barista Ezenwa. That can submit that the best form of evidence in the circumstances is documentary evidence. 
And this is because the claimant who was employed by a document as defendant usually practice can only be confirmed by letter of confirmation. In conclusion, counsel has just wanted the court to dismiss the entire suit of the claimant. I've gone through all the process in this case, in this suit, including the counsel legal submissions. To my mind, the issue as distilled by claimant's counsel for determination of this court are quite poignant. To address the concern of the parties in this suit, I shall therefore adopt the issue and determination of the suit. In my mind, the most convenient point to kickstart consideration of the parties' case in this judgment is to identify facts that are not contested by the parties. Parties are in agreement that there was a contract of employment. The only point of the divergence is where the defendants is whether the defendants are jointly and separately bound by the contract of employment. The claimant in paragraph seven and eight of witness statement of oath attempted to establish contract of employment between him and the defendants. He tendered an evidence as letter of employment. The letter on conditions of service was admitted and marked as XB CW1001A, CW1001B, and CW1001C. Defendants admit this set of facts. Claimant counsel argued that the letter of employment was null and invalid because according to him, it was breached. I do not agree with him. The fact that an agreement was breached or the fact that an agreement was breached does not render it invalid. Defendant concede that there was a valid contract of employment. I agree with them. The only quarrel of the defendant with issue of contract of employment is that the first defendant is and should not be joined or made a party to it. This is a long principle of law or adjectival law that facts admitted need no further proof. Section 75 of the Evidence Act and the cases of Arab and B against ABI Limited and Oparki against Obono. The first defender had contended that there was no privity of contract between it and the claimant. In fact, let me for ease of reference call court by between the defendant's evidence in paragraph seven of the joint witness statement of oath in this regard. And I quote, that the defendants deny paragraph seven, eight, nine, and 10 of statement of facts to the extent that the claimant was employed by the Fidelity Union Securities Limited second defendant, now known as Fidelity Securities Limited third defendant and seconded to the first defendant as a not counter. Therefore, the first defendant did not at any point in time enter into any form of contract of employment with the claimer, unquote. I resolve this seeming intricate question. I shall have resort to the letter of employment. This to me is the surface route. In taking this route, I find refuge in section 91 and section 92 of the Evidence Act. It is now firmly established law that documentary evidence is the best evidence. It is the best proof of the contents of such document and no oral evidence will be allowed to discredit or contradict the content thereof, except where fraud is created. Whereas in the instant case, a document that is letter of employment is admitted in evidence with respect to an improved contract of employment and the document having been admitted as genuine, correct and existing oral evidence cannot be given or ascribed preference over the content of the said document. See, I am wary against a one and Jalili against a The letter of employment exhibits CWN001, which is written on the Fidelity Union Securities Limited reads, and I quote, December 4, 2007, Okpara Ugochuku Gibson, letter of employment. We refer to your application for employment to the company and have the pleasure in make, making you the following offer effective immediately. You will be offered as not counter on secondment to Fidelity Bank PLC. As you come in, the bank's human resources team will take you through their five shared value. Kindly sign it in space provided if you accept our offer. Thank you. You are first please, Chris Okenwa of Fidelity Union Securities Limited. The contract of employment or conditions of offer contain the space provided for signature of the claimant, 
contract of employment condition of a smart as XBCW1001B. It is very explicit from XBCW1001A that claimant was employed as a note counter and on condiment of fidelity bank PLC, the first dependent. The question that Bigpo answers is what is the meaning and legal implication of a secondment? A secondment is a temporary transfer of an employee to another role or business area away from his or her primary duty. See the case of Tagunoru against Goton. Clemon was employed for the first defender. He never for once served the second defender. He was never transferred. He served only the first defendant for about four years. XBCW 1001 it states clearly that Clement is offered employment as a not counter and his employment is with immediate effect. This proposes that the claimant was employed by the defendants for the service of the first defendant. I am fortified in this position by global reading of XBCW 1001A and XBCW 001B from XBCW 001B, particularly conditions of offer and period of notice close thereof. It was more abundantly clear that Clement was in the employment of the first defender. In order to properly drive home this point, let me sound like a broken record. XBCW100B, on a period of notice close, Clement on probation is required to give a two weeks written notice of intention to resign to the bank. And on confirmation, he is required to give a minimum of one month. The bank also undertakes to give you a one month notice or pay salary in lieu. I find and hold that the second defendant is a mere recruitment agent of a disclosed principal. The riddle here is, if the first defendant was not the employer, how did it fall on it to determine the employment? A closer look at exhibit CW1002, it's very large on this point. Let me try to reproduce the, the exhibit. February 8, 2011, Ugochuku, we give to your termination of employment. This is to inform you that your services are no longer required. Consequently, you are here by this letter terminated from the employment of the bank whose effect from February 9, 2011. Clement's employment was terminated from Clement's employment was terminated from employment of the bank. In Iowa Erie against Bendel Feed and Plower Mills, the Supreme Court held that in the case of joint tort vessels, where several persons are jointly liable. The plaintiffs has a liberty to select and sue anyone or any number of them, and he can recover his claim in full from those he sued. See also a son against Russo Plastic Limited, and the case of Carlin Nigeria Limited against University of Jones, where the Supreme Court held that the University of Jones, being an official legal entity, can only enter into contract through its agents, namely its officers and servants. The court further held that the contract made by an agent acting in the scope of his authority for a disclosed principal. It is below the contract of principal, and the principal, not the agent, is a proper person to sue upon such contract. Pendant counsel argued that claim was not confirmed. The submissions did not represent the evidence on record. The defendant stated that claimants was entitled to a month basic salary in lieu of notice. This somewhat accords with content of XBCW1001, which it reads, and I quote, during probation, staff is required to give minimum of two weeks written notice of intention to resign his or her employment with the bank. On confirmation, the bank undertake to give a minimum of one month notice of any termination of employment, or will pay salary in lieu of notice. Probation is the testing of a person's abilities or behavior to find out if such a person is suitable. It is a suspension of a person's final appointment to an office until such person by his conduct proves himself fit to occupy the office. See total Nigeria PLC against the law. Clement served the defendants for about four years. He was terminated for inability to demonstrate capacity and competence. The reason for termination is that his service was no longer required. With all that I have said above, I find and hold that Clayman was an employee of the defendants and that his employment was by conduct of the defendant deemed compact. Be a monopoly against Kuala State College of Education and Dr. Mukbam and uh, Ross E. Ogura and others. I cited all the authorities. In the event that I am wrong in my position, that Clayman's employment was confirmed, I have looked at contract of employment and I found nowhere. Clement can be denied his entitlement. Maybe his employment is not confirmed. 
I will resolve the issue of employment of claimant by the defendant. The question is whether the termination was in compliance with contract of employment. Under contract of employment, defendant to give you a maximum of one month notice of any termination of employment or will pay salary in lieu thereof. Parties have signed on to XBCW100B as a document to regulate their relationship. They are bound by it and on no account should terms extraneous to the contract or on which there is no agreement be read into the contract. See your sister against to leave Cocoa Processing Company. I find and hold that the claimant is entitled to be paid a one month salary in lieu of notice. Defendant counsel has argued wrongly in my home review that claimant is entitled to only basic salary. The contract of employment did not say so. Counsel cannot supplant hard core evidence, which is legal submissions. Contract of employment stated that he is entitled to salary. He did not say basic salary. And counsel should not introduce extraneous words into the contract of employment. The numeration clause therefore in the letter of employment reads and I quote, salary will be paid at the rate of 638 Naira 081.00 gross per annum. Salary will be paid in areas on the 23rd of each week. Dependent did not controvert the salary breakdown in the CW1001C. The letter contended that claimant was entitled to basic salary. As such, the fact they are in a dim put. Dependent have added that claimant was indebted to First defendant in the sum of 7,586.63. And that having set up their monthly 4,130 monthly basic salary, claimer had not left them. They rely on DW001. DW001A, the claimant, rightly in my home review, challenged the defendant to produce proof of delivery of DW001. DW001A to the claimant. Defendants were unable to produce any of such proof because there is no. I'm unable to believe the narrative of the defendants in this regard. I find them to be unbelievable, incredible, and an afterthought, aim feeling a yearning gap in their case. Therefore, I find and hold that the claimants, the claimant is entitled to one month salary in lieu of notice, and I so hold. Claimant praised the court for award of general damages. It is track law that in matters of contract employment, where an employee prove an infraction of the terms of employment, the employee will be entitled to damages. It will be what will do to the employer for a period of notice. Seashell Petroleum Company Limited against Olaru Wadu. I have earlier in this judgment, well, that the defendants violated the contract of employment by not paying claim on one month's salary in lieu of notice. They have hold on to the claimant's one month's salary from 15th February 2011 till date. I note, however, that the claimant gross is for defendant's refusal to pay his one month salary in lieu of notice, and not that his employment was terminated for any misconduct. Claimant is therefore entitled to one month salary as general damages, being what will have been due to him if the defendants had faithfully observed the conditions of service. In the final analysis, I hold that the case of the claimant succeeds. With the avoidance of doubt, prayers one, two, three are granted. On prayer three, big claimants is entitled to 53,173.42 cobo as general damages. 10% for judgment interest is awarded to judgment sum is fully paid. And claimant failed to leave evidence on pre judgment interest. And therefore, prayer four is hereby refused. And I award the sum of 100,000 naira as cause against the uh, defendants. And judgment is hereby entered accordingly. <laughs> As the court pleases. As the court pleases. Yes. Uh, who, who is there? Is uh, is the the other matter NSC and YN thirty seven? Mr. Kalama John Tompre. Are the parties there? Uh, uh, the claimants are not around now, but uh, they are represented by me. Uh, I S Dama Bide, my lord. Yes, Ali Dama Bide. Yes, my lord. You are for who? I am for the claimants, my lord. Mr. Stanley Demabin. Thank you. 
Is counsel to the defendants here? Yes. There's, no, there's nothing to indicate the presence of uh, the defendants' counsel. I can't seem to see any link here, my lord. That indicates otherwise, bro. Counsel to the defender is not here. Uh, that's 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 the impression I have, my lord. I've looked I've looked through the list and I can't see any representation that suggests uh, they are present. <laughs> Yes, this is a judgment of the court. Yes, Stanley, can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear, my lord. Okay. Thank you, my lord. The claimant by an originating someone dated and filed on the second day of August 2019 claims for the determination of the following questions whether by virtue of section two sub one and section five sub six of the Trade Unions Act at T14, laws of the Federation of Nigeria 2004, the first, first set of defendants and persons they represent and lead can operate or run a parallel trade union in any unregistered trade union name, including the academic staff of secondary school ASUS, whether by virtue of section four and six of the Police Act at P19, laws of the Federation of Nigeria 2004, the second defendant has an obligation law to prosecute any person or persons, including the first set of defendant who acts in breach of section two of the Trade Union Act and punishable under section 50 of the same act. In answers to the foregoing, if answers to the foregoing are in the negative, question one, and in the positive, question two, the claimant's claim as follows. A declaration to the effect that the first set of defendants and persons they represent are laid cannot operate or run a parallel trade union for teachers in Bahasa State in any unregistered trade union name, including the name Academic Staff Union of Secondary Schools, ASUS, and other perpetual injunction restraining the first set of dependents or their assigned associates and previous from operating or running a parallel trade union for teachers in any registered trade union name, including the name Academic Staff Union of Secondary Schools, ASUS. A declaration that the first set of defendants operation or running of the parallel trade union for teachers in Bahasa State, any registered trade union name, including the name Academic Staff Union of Secondary Schools Associates is in breach of Section 2 of Trade Union Act and constitute an offense punishable under Section 50. By the second claim. Attached to the affidavit are five annexures marked as XBX A to E and a written address. In response to the originating summons, the first set of defendants filed a memorandum of condition appearance dated 6th day of November 2019 and filed on the 17th day of November 2019. The first set of defendants also filed a 25 paragraphs counter affidavit dated the second. On the fourth day of February 2020, objection. February 2020. The first set of defendants filed a notice of preliminary objection dated 9th day of July 2020 and filed on the 14th day of July 2020. The application is brought under the inherent jurisdiction 
of this honorable court, the defendants' applicants are praying for the following. An order of this honorable court striking out this suit for lack of jurisdiction to hear and entertain this matter. And an order of this honorable court striking out this suit on the ground that it is incompetent. And an order of striking out this suit as same is an abuse of process of this court. And then the honorable prayer. The grounds upon which this application is predicated is set out in the schedule as follows. First, that the second set of defendant is a federal government agency and it is only the federal high court that is vested with the jurisdiction to issue an order of mandamus against this. And the claimants have not fulfilled the condition precedent to the issuance of mandamus before filing this action. And that Academic Union of Secondary Schools, ASUS, and the purported person, the first set of defendants represent and lead are not parties to this suit. And this one court can make an order against persons who are not parties to the suit. And the issue order, the first set of defendants can operate under the name Academic Staff Union of Secondary Schools, ASUS, or in any other name, is the subject of litigation in suit number FSC ABGCS slash 31C08. And an interlocutory appeal is pending at the Supreme Court in SC 433-2014 between Charles O'Fallu and another and the Joint Union of Teachers. That this suit is a multiplication of action and as such an abuse of the process of this court. The right being claimed in this suit is the right of the Joint Union of Teachers and not that of the claimants. And that the claimants lacks local standard to file the suit. The application is supported by six paragraphs of affidavit and attached to the affidavit is one and next marked as XBA and the written address. In the written address, learned counsel to the first set of defendants applicants formulated a sole issue for determination as follows. Whether in the circumstances of this case, this honorable court has a jurisdiction to entertain and determine this suit. In arguing the sole issue for determination, counsel submitted that this court lacks the required jurisdiction to entertain, hear and determine the suit based on the following grounds. The applicant must show that he has met applicant. And Sam was refused. And thirdly, the Leonard Council for that submitted that the academic staff union of secondary schools asked to, and the person the first defender represent and lead alleged by the claimants are not parties to the suit. It is a trial law that a court cannot make an order against a person who is not before the court, as a court lacks jurisdiction to do so. And fourthly, learned counsel submitted that the claimants be not being a trade union, lack the locals to file the suit on the ground that the live thought in this suit is for the benefit of the Nigerian Union of Teachers, who is not a party to the suit. The claimants in paragraph one of their supporting affidavit stated that the Nigerian Union of Teachers they are, they are fronting for is a registered trade union. In other words, the Nigerian Union of Teachers can sue and be sued in its registered name and not through surrogates like the claimants. The claimants, therefore, have no personal interest in the subject matter in the suit. And they cited several cases, Shipkau against Ages and Brass State, and the case of Yusufu against Governor of Edo State. In conclusion, counsel has just got to strike out the suit. And the claimants, in response to the first set of defendants' preliminary objection, the claimants filed a six paragraph counter affidavit, dated and filed on the 28th of July, 2020, on a written address. In the written address, learned counsel to the claimants formulated three issues for determination as follows A, whether the parties in the subject matter in suit number FHC slash ABG slash CS slash 31C slash 08 and appeal number SC slash 433 slash 2004 are not one and the same in the suit and whether by the provision of section 254C1A and B of the 1999 Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria as amended, and section 17 sub 12 of the National Industrial Court Act 2006, this honorable court can order the second defendant to act in preservation of the provisions of the Trade Union Act, and whether the claimants have the requisite local standard to institute this action. In arguing the first issue for determination, counsel submitted that 
the subject matter in suite number A, APET C, A, C, B, J, C, S, 31, C, 0, 8, and appeal number SC slash 433-2014 is obviously not the same with the present suit. Council argues that suit number FSCA BJCS 31608 has and its subject matter is your propriety of registration of any other trade union for teachers outside the Nigerian Union of Teachers, while the subject matter of the present suit is whether the first set of defendants can run or operate any parallel trade union in any or registered name, and whether the first defendant by the first like second defendant for not doing so, given the provisions of section 21, 2 sub 1, and section 5 sub 6, and section 50 of the Trade Union Act, SCAP T40 laws of the Federation of Nigeria 2004. Council submitted that it is obvious from the records that the parties are also not the same, while the claim of their in assuming for themselves and on behalf of members of the Nigerian Union of Teachers by us as a chapter against the first set of defendants in their individual and collective capacities as well as the Commissioner of Police by the state. On the second issue, whether the provision of section 24C, C1A and B of 1999 constitution as amended as section 171 and two of the National Industrial Court of Nigeria Act 2006, this honorable court can compel the second defendant to act in preservation of the provisions of the Trade Union Act. Council submitted that it is strike law that the judicial court in Nigeria it's as conferred either by the constitution or the enabling status which established that court. And he cited the case of my Atlantarchy against Tongo and others. Council contended that by virtue of section 2541B of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria as amended, this court has, has to the exclusion of any other court, jurisdiction, civil cases, and matters relating or connected with or arising from status, including the Trade Union Act. That this honorable court has the powers to make an order of anonymous requiring any act to be done or an order of prohibition, notwithstanding that the order is made against an officer or authority. Council submitted that, assuming it has conceded that this court lacks jurisdiction to make an order compelling an agent of the federal government to do an act. First set of defendants object to are not contending that this court lacks powers to grant the beliefs being fought. Said it is set law that the court jurisdiction will only be hosted simply because it lacks jurisdiction to grant some of the reliefs claim, as long as the subject matter is within the court's jurisdiction. He cited Garba against Mohammed and others. On the third issue, whether the claimant had the requisite local standard to institute this action, council answered in the affirmative and submitted that the facts are due and the applicable law it's what determines the right and obligations of parties. A party who has been agreed by another naturally has the right to sue, put CM as local standard. He cited the case of Daniel against INEC and others. Conclusion, Council just called to dismiss the preliminary objection raised by the first set of defendants as no basis exists for a, for a positive consideration and grant of sin. The preliminary objection was taken together with the substantive suit as permitted by order 18 with three of the rules of this court. The preliminary objection was thus argued on the same third day of November 2020 before the original By the in support of the original summons, the post by Mr. Hector Johnson, the second claim, it is the claimant's case that the first claimant himself, as the chairman and secretary respectively of the Biasa State Chapter of the Nigerian Union of Teachers, while the second defendant is the officer in charge of Biasa State Command. The Nigerian police force. The first set of defendants are members of the executive council of an unregistered trade union that was named the Academic Staff Union of Secondary School ASUS. The second claimant states that the claimants are members of the Nigerian Union of Teachers, NUT, a registered trade union that protects and promotes the interests of all teachers across all levels of the education strata in Nigeria. But as has stated inclusive, and has so been since 1982. Said in 2017, the first set of defendants, the, for, the first and second defendants in the first set of defendants, and 10 others, as claiming instituted suit number NICNYEN 1M 2017, where they claim for an order of perpetual injunction, restrain the claimant and enjoy union of teachers as respondent from infringing on their right to assemble or associate under the name of ASUS. However, the action was struck out, ASUS not being a registered trade union. But the first set of defendants continue to operate under the name and parading themselves as trade union 
harassing members of the Nigerian Union of Teachers. This action caused him to write a letter to the Ministry of Labor seeking for clarification on the status of the Academic Staff Union of Secondary Schools, ASUS. And in reply, the State Controller of Bias State Office of Federal Ministry of Labor wrote to them a letter informing them that the Academic Staff Union of Secondary School is not a registered trade union and as such cannot operate as one. The second claimant stated that the peace and stability of the trade union community, as well as the well-being of its members have been threatened by the AFU stated action of the defendants who have been acting and writing letters to some Biasta State government officials as a parallel, parallel trade union, hence they have stated this action. It is the key, the case of the defendants, that the first set of defendants in response to the originating sum filed a 25 paragraphs counter affidavit at the second day of January 2020. And attached to the counter affidavit are five annexures marked as exhibit A to E respectively. The counter the counter affidavit. Deposed to by one comrade, or his queen C, or the fourth defendant in this suit. It is the first set of defendants' case that the Nigerian Union of Teachers, particularly its leadership, does not protect and promote the interests of its members. Hence, secondary school teachers have massively withdrawn their membership from the National Union of Teachers, AUT, and requested from their employers to stop deduction of check of dues from their salaries in favor of the Nigerian Union of Teachers. And following this withdrawal, the claimants. An Nigerian Union of Teachers officers embark on a campaign of calumny against the secondary school teachers who have withdrawn their membership from the Nigerian Union of Teachers with a view to continue the deduction of check of dues, even though they have withdrawn their membership from the Nigerian Union of Teachers. It is their case that the claimants engaged the officers of Nigerian police to intimidate and harass them for withdrawing their membership. It was against this backdrop that they filed suit number NICMYEM 2017 between Comrade Abredent Oenemi and others against Kalama John Tompre and others. Here yeah, about that, the academic staff union of secondary schools has never operated or paraded itself as a trade union, registered trade union. Neither did they at any time harass any member of the Nigerian Union of Teachers. It stated that ASUS is a body in process of registering its association as a trade union. That soon after ASUS commences its registration as a trade union and some was approved by Ministry of Labor and Productivity. The Nigerian Union of Teachers quickly rushed to court to stop the completion of the registration by the Registrar of Trade Union. But ASUS, known as the status in all the state of the Federation, and has conducted itself in orderly manner. But because the Nigerian Union of Teachers does not want to stop the deduction of check of dues from the persons that have withdrawn their membership from, from the union, from the union, it always attacked ASUS for its failure to care for its members, which led to many teachers opted out from the union. That both Nigerian Union of Teachers and ASUS are presently in court, both at Federal High Court of Abuja and Supreme Court of Nigeria over the issue building or registration of ASUS. Even the Federal Minister of Labor and its in the party, in the file at National Industrial Court of Nigeria, Inugu Judicial Division, by Nigerian Union of Teachers, which is similar to the suit. The Federal Minister of Labor and Productivity is a party, and their counsel filed a counter affidavit which is germane to this case. The case of the second defendants to the originating summon is that if I, second defendant filed an 11 paragraphs counter affidavit dated and filed on the 6th day of February 2020, and attached is a written address. The counter affidavit deposed to by one sergeant Wangi Darlington, an administration officer, the legal or prosecution unit state CID of the Nigerian Police by Asa State Command, Yerabu. The second defendant's case that the second defendant has no interest whatsoever in the subject matter of this suit and therefore ought not to have been joined in this suit as a defendant. That no paragraph of the supporting affidavit as well as the relief thought in this suit made reference to the second defendant except relief D, which is not granted. A second defendant can only prosecute suspects on the outcome of his investigation by the second defendant, if any. It stated that the Nigerian police by a state command under the second defendant perform its duties in accordance with let down rules and law and not liable on any of the claimants' claim in terms demonstrated in the originating summons. In their written address, in support of the originating summons, the claimants formulated two issues for determination, which I, I reproduce here. And in arguing the first issue,
and in arguing the first issue for determination, council submitted that it is a trifle that where the role of principal person is an action, in an action is that of construction of a written law or any instrument made under any written law or of any document or some other questions of law. Coordinating someone is an appropriate mode for commencement of such action. Cited the case of Yuzegu against Wano and others. Council further submitted that the Trade Union Act make provisions with respect to the information, registration, and organization of trade union. They refer to the preamble to the Trade Unions Act. Council contended that the Nigerian Union of Teachers, to the claim belong to, and are leaders of the Biasa State Chapter, is registered pursuant to the provisions of the Trade Union Act to represent the interests of teachers, excluding those in the universities. Council argued that the first set of defendants operating under the registered names, including the Academic Staff Union of Secondary School ASU, an organization not registered pursuant to the Trade Union Act, have been parading themselves as a trade union and have been quiet members of the Nigerian Union of Teachers, claiming they are the recognized body authorized to represent the interests of secondary school teachers. And this is highly prohibited by Section 271 of the Trade Union Act. Council submitted that the Provisional Trade Union Act, Part T14, also the Federation of Nigeria 2004, cited above are clear and unambiguous and must be given their ordinary meaning vis a vis the applicable facts. They cited the case of Ardu against Iyako. Council further submitted that the construction of the aforesighted relevant section of Trade Union Act vis a vis the action of the first set of defendants is that the first set of defendants cannot operate as a trade union under any registered trade union including the Academic Staff Union of Secondary School, ASUS, and as such will be in breach of the expert prohibition of Trade Union Act, and all this one will call to so hold. The second is to consider submitted that the union policy is vested with general powers to detect and prevent crimes, and also comp enforce compliance with all the laws and regulations of Nigeria. I hear part section four and section six of the Police Act. Council argues that as deposed to in the claim of support and affidavit, and evidence by Exhibit E, and their claims as contained in Exhibit B. First set of defendants have been parading themselves as trade union, writing letters claiming to be members of trade union, and trying to coerce members of the claimants in the union of teachers, alleging that they are the union that represent the interests of secondary schools, teachers, without first complying with the provisions of trade union acts with regard to the registration. In conclusion, he urged this court to grant the reliefs of the claimants. Answer to the first set of defendants before again his issue for determination, respond to the issues for determination raised by the claimants council and submitted that the issues couched by the claimants for determination of this court do not follow from the fact of this court, thereby making them academic issues. From the fact of this case, academic issues and court do not embark on academic questions. Council contended that the first issue formulated by the claimants bordered on registration of ASUS as a trade union. The issue whether ASUS should be allowed to operate or not, and whether ASUS should be registered or not, and the subject matter between NUT and ASUS in suit number FIACJ218 before the Federal High Court of Abuja and the Supreme Court between Charles O'Palui and another against the Union of Teachers. Said so this suit is a multiplicity of suit, which is an abuse of the process of this court. Council argued that there is no evidence to show that the first set of defendants are threatening members of the Nigerian Union of Teachers. Council submitted further that the law does not prohibit all registered trade union, all registered union from existing. But as a matter of fact, the provision of trade union act recognizes the existence of all registered union have been provided for deduction of levies to be made from salaries of its members to enable it to register. It refers to section 2A of the Trade Union Act. Council further argues that it is clear that the issue of controversy, the deduction of take of dues from the salary of secondary school teachers who are withdrawn their membership from the claimants are not whether ASUS registered, whether ASUS can operate or not, as none of these issues arose with the illegal deduction of check of dues by the claimants from non members. From non members of the Nigerian Union of Teachers and the use of the officer of the Nigerian Police Force. To arrest the first set of defendants, Council argued that the other things the claimants are talking about are a mere scheme to blindfold this court from seeing the real issues. Direct Council further submitted that membership of trade union in Nigeria is voluntary. No trade union, including the Union of Teachers, is allowed to victimize those who have 
contracted out from the Union. We will ask Section 12.4 of the Trade Union Act and Section 40 of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. An arguing issue for determination. And as submitted by, by virtue of Section 40 of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Trade Union Act, and Section 5 sub 3 of the Labor Act, the first set of the federal letter and unhindered right contract out of the Nigerian Union of Teachers to state stoppage of take off from their salaries in favor of the Nigerian Union of Teachers. And the right, right to form to join any association, political party, or to the union, and exclusively that of the individual citizen, and not for the claimant to use the money they illegally deducted from the first set of the first day to join as members of the Conclusion Council urged the court to dismiss this case to substantial for some being very frivolous and vexatious. In response to the first set of defendant counter affidavit, the claimants filed a seven paragraphs reply affidavit dated and filed on the fourth day of February 2020, attached to the reply affidavit is a written address. In the written address, counsel argued that the submission of the first set of defendants that the claimant case is mere academic exercise that is not supported by facts does not hold water because it is an examination of the relief thoughts, the grounds upon which they are thought, and the facts rely upon that will determine the true state of the case and not the submission of counsel to defendant. He cited the case of C Truck Limited against Aboro. Other stated that the claimant process and not the defendant's argument that is looked at to determine the presence of course of action, which arises which arises from combination of defendant's wrongful act. He cited the case of Bakari against NRC and Atiku Abubakar against Eradua. He said, no academic matter raised for the purpose of intellectual argument, which does not affect live issues. Council argues that the first set of defendants did not deny paragraph four of the claimant supporting affidavit. In response to the first set of defendants submission that section two sub 11 of the Trade Union Act recognizes the existence of an unregistered trade union. Council submitted that the provision there only allows for taking up steps to register and to collect dues for registration purposes. Conclusion, Council urges on the court to grant the claimants relief. In response to the original motions filed by the, second, by the claimant, second set of defendants filed an 11 paragraph counter affidavit dated and filed on 6th day of February 2020. Attached to the counter affidavit is a written address and they formulated two issues for determination. Whether the originating summer as well as supporting affidavit in this suit discloses any reasonable cause of action against the second defendant and whether the second defendant can validly institute criminal proceeding against any of the first set of defendants or any persons without a valid complaint and or investigation. In arguing the first issue for determination, counsel answered the negative and submitted that it is a threat law that in determination of whether a cause of action has disclosed a, against any of the defendants, the court should only consider the writ of summons and the statement of claim. Relied of seven of Butlin Company against Abiola and Sons, that in the instant case, as commenced by the originating uh, summon, what the court will consider, whether there is reasonable action, cause of action against second defendant, is a supporting affidavit. I relied on the 13 rule 15 and the 13 rule 6 of 2 of the rules of this court. In conclusion, at the time so many submissions, counsel urged this court to dismiss the suit in its entirety for lacking like merit, being frivolous and abuse of court process with substantial cost of 500,000 naira awarded against the claimants and in favor of the second defendant. I have carefully examined the process filed by both parties. I've evaluated David, uh, the government's contained both the supporting and opposing affidavit to gather the exhibits. But before I go further, let me start with the notice of preliminary objection filed by the first set of defendants challenging the jurisdiction of this court. The defendants' applicants prayed to this court to strike out this suit for lack of jurisdiction. The defendants' applicants raised so many issues of law. But let me take the issues in seriously. Firstly, that the second set of defendants is a federal government agency, and it is only the federal high court that is vested with the jurisdiction to entertain this matter. This is a total misconception of the law. What indeed actually determined the jurisdiction of the court? This answer to this question is given in the case of IE Case Trust Limited against Adebo. 
reported in 2008, 10 NWR part 1076, 212 at page 630, paragraph F to H. Not that courts are creatures of statutes, and it is a statute that created a particular court that will confer on it its jurisdiction. See your quality against our side. Having said this, section 254C sub 1 of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, 1999, as amended, provides thus, and I quote, notwithstanding the provision of section 251, 257, 252, and anything contained in this Constitution, and in addition to such jurisdiction as may be conferred upon it by an act of the National Assembly, the National Industrial Court shall have an exercise jurisdiction to the exclusion of any other court in civil courts and matters, A, relating to or connected with any labor, employment, trade unions, and matters incidental thereto or connected therewith. B, related to or connected with or arising from factories act, trade dispute act, trade unions act, labor act, or any other enactment replacing the acts or laws, unquote. From the originating process file, one can see that the claimants approach this court for interpretation and enforcement of the provisions of trade union acts. Provisions of the trade union act. And by section 254C sub 1 of the constitution, one can see that it is within the exclusive preserve of this court, since what determines the jurisdiction of the court is the nature of the plaintiff's claim before the court. See the dictum of Onoge JSC in ASTC against Quorum Consortium Limited. Therefore, not minding the parties in this matter, this court is the best evidence to adjudicate on this matter. And therefore, this court has every jurisdiction to entertain this matter, and I so hold. On the second issue, that this suit is an abuse of process of this court, that the subject matter in suit number FSCA BJCS 31C 2008 and appeal number SC 433 2014 are same. Are the same with this suit. I wish to state that I've carefully examined the process. That's exhibit C. And I came to conclusion that the parties are not the same. And likewise, the relief thought. Therefore, this suit is not an abuse of process of this court. The latter borders on the interpretation of some provisions of Trade Union Act which borders on operating a parallel trade union. While the former borders on issue of registration, registering another trade union intended to cater for teachers after there was an already existing registered trade union operating or catering on that aspect. Therefore, SEN cannot be an abuse of process of this court. I so hope. On the third issue that the claimants lack the local standard to file this suit. Local standard or standing to sue is the legal right of a party to an action to be had in litigation before a court of law or tribunal. A person is said to have local standard if he has shown sufficient interest in the action and that his civil rights and obligations have been or are in danger of being infringed. See in Akoju against Adeleke. And the burden is on the plaintiff to prove that he has the local standard to commence an action and failure to discharge the burden the action must fail. See contract resource Nigeria Limited against Wendy. Having said all this, the first and second claimants instituted this action for themselves and on behalf of members of the Nigerian Union of Teachers by Asa State Chapter. Supposedly, the claimants are all members of the Nigerian Union of Teachers. While I agree with the claimants as members of NUT, they can institute this action even without joining NUT as a party in this suit. But before doing that, the claimant must produce evidence to actually show that they are registered members of the Nigerian Union of Teachers by a state chapter before they can have the local standard to institute this action. This the claimant can do by either attaching or annexing their identification cards or receipt evidencing payments of check of dues, which the claimants fail to do so. In view of that, it is my ardent belief that the claimants had failed to show to this court their legal right to institute this action. And as such, this action must fail. I so hold. But assuming that the court of appeal, in its pure wisdom, felt otherwise, I will go ahead and treat the issues raised by parties in the originating summons. 
The claimants filed this action seeking for this court to interpret the provisions of section two sub one and five sub six of Trade Union Act, Part T40 laws of the Federation of Nigeria 2004. The claimants are contending that the first set of defendants cannot operate or run a parallel or registered trade union, including the Academic Start Union of Secondary Schools, ASUS. And if that the first set of defendants have been violated section two of the Trade Unions Act, they want this court to compel the second set of defendants to arrest and prosecute them. In order to determine this matter, I, floated, I formulated a long issue for determination, whether from the process filed by the claimants, whether the claimant is entitled to all or some of the relief thought. There is no any doubt about it, that by the combined provision of section two sub one and section five sub six of trade union act, before any trade union can act and operate as one, same must be registered and a certificate of registration must be issued. And section 50 of the act criminalizes the operation of any trade union without registration. However, the third schedule of the Trade Union Act cannot be interpreted or read in isolation without considering the entire content of the act. More so, the provision of section 12 sub 4 specifically clarified this issue and provided those that membership of any trade union is voluntary rather than compulsory. And no employee can be forced to becoming a member of a trade union. The aforementioned provision of the Trade Union Act is reproduced here and under for ease of reference, and I quote, Notwithstanding anything to the contrary in this act, membership of a trade union by employees shall be voluntary, and no employee shall be forced to join any trade union or be victimized for refusing to join or remain as a member on court. It is submitted that the provision of the Trade Union Act is also consistent and in conformity with the provision of Section 40 of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria 1999 as amended, which provides, and I quote, Every person shall be entitled to assemble freely and associate with other persons. And in particular, he may form or belong to any political party, trade union, or any other association for the protection of his interests, unquote. From the above provision of the Constitution, it is beyond debate that the right of workers or persons to form or join a trade union is guaranteed by the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Furthermore, the supremacy of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria can be, cannot be overemphasized. Hence, in view of the express provision of Section 40 of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria 1999 as amended, which guarantees freedom of association, it is unequivocally clear that the membership of any association of trade unions, such as the Nigerian Union of Teachers by Asa State Chapter, is voluntary. And the existence of such trade union does not preclude the formation of another body be it a trade union or an association for the purpose of protecting the interests of its members. In view of the above analysis, it is therefore submitted that the members of ASUS are not bound to be members of the Nigerian Union of Teachers by Assisted Chapter. They thus acted within their constitutionally guaranteed right and within the ambits of the law when they formed the academic staff union of secondary school in order to care for the welfare and interests of their members, though not registered as a trade union. It is worthy to note that, just like other trade union registration under the Trade Union Act, the Nigerian Union. The Nigerian Union of Teachers is regulated by subject to the Trade Union Act, Labor Act, Pension Reform Act. There is nothing in this law or any other law that empowers the Nigerian Union of Teachers to regulate other associations or trade unions with similar objectives. The Nigerian Union of Teachers, therefore, has no power to accredit or issue waiver to ASUS or any other association to enable them to operate. The issue of right and procedure of collection of check of dues by a trade union is set out in 
Section 5, sub 3, and 4 of the Labor Act, for ease of referencing, is here by reproduce as follows. And I quote Open the registration and recognition of any of the trade unions specified in Part A of Schedule 3 to the Trade Union Act. The employee shall A, make deduction from the wages of all workers eligible to be members of the union so required, and B, pay any sum so deducted to the union. But a worker may contract out of the system in writing. And when he has done so, no deductions shall be made from his wages in respect of contributions mentioned in paragraph A of this section. And subsection 4 provides, no deduction shall be made from the wages and salaries of your persons who are eligible members of any of the trade unions specified in Part B of Schedule 3 of the Trade Union Act, except if the person concerned has accepted in writing to make voluntary contributions to the trade union, unquote. It is opined that the position of the law in respect of deduction of wages of workers or pensioners under the Labor Act, specifically Section 5 sub 4 of the Labor Act, is very clear. In this regard, it is stated that the consent of a person who are eligible as a member of trade union, specified in Part B of Schedule 3 to the Trade Union Act, is a condition precedent for deduction from his wages and salaries of any sum for the purpose of remitting some to the trade union. In other words, a worker, or in this circumstance, each individual has to accept or consent in writing before the deductions can be made from his or her wages and salaries. Assuming but not conceding that he or she is a member of the Nigerian Union of Teachers by a state chapter, the implication of the provision of Section 5 or 4 of the Labor Act is that there must be voluntariness of a membership or an eligible member to contribute to the trade union, the absence of which invalidates any deduction from his or her wages. One major question for consideration is whether there is any document to show that members of ASUS consented in writing that their wages and salaries be deducted by Nigerian Union of Teachers by Assistant Chapter. Upon a careful perusal of the exhibits and clothes therein, there is no document emanating from ASUS evidencing consent by each of the member of ASUS to the deduction of a percentage of their wages at check of dues in favor of the Nigerian Union of Teachers by Assistant States. It is submitted that the law imposes a condition precedent to the deduction of any sums of money from wages and salaries of employees, including teachers. That condition must be satisfied before NUT can validly act by deducting the check of dues from the members of ASUS. Assuming but not conceding that there is anything to show that members of ASUS are recognized members of the Nigerian Union of Teachers by the State Chapter NUT, each individual member is still at liberty to validly opt out of the checkup system in line with the provision of Section 5 sub 3 of the Labor Act. And upon doing so, no deduction shall be made out of his or her wages. Unfortunately, there is nothing to show that members of ASUS are members of NUT and are individually considered in writing that the said take up dues be deducted from their wages by NUT. Any deduction made in this regard without them having first obtained their consent becomes invalid. In fact, Exhibit A had attested to that, that some members of the ASUS had opted out. See the case of Governing Council of NTI Kaduna and another against NASU, where the Court of Appeal held, and I quote, the issue is not whether the appellants are bound to recognize the respondent. The issue is that before any deduction can be made from the wages and salaries of the employees, they must consent in writing, unquote. In view of the Court of Appeal decision, the issue therefore is not whether the academic staff union of secondary schools recognize, registered or not. The issue is that before any deduction can be made from members of ASUS by the Nigerian Union of Teachers by ASUS chapter, each of the member of ASUS must consent in writing. Otherwise, any deduction from wages of the ASUS members by NUT without his consent is invalid. More so, the fact that ASUS is not duly registered as a trade union does not prevent or preclude it from collecting dues or subscription from its members, which may be necessary for the purpose of getting the association registered as a trade union. The above position of the law is evidenced in the proviso to section two sub one of trade union act and for ease of reference, is here by reproduce as follows, and I quote, a trade union shall not perform any act in presence of the purposes for which it has been formed, unless it has been registered under this act. 
provided that nothing in this section shall prevent a trade union from taking any steps, including the collection of subscriptions or dues which may be necessary for the purpose of getting the union registered. It is also pertinent to note that the above provision of section two sub one of the trade union act cited above is without prejudice to the constitutional right to freely assemble and form an association for the purpose of protecting their interests. In this vein, as used by us as state are not mandated to metamorphose into a trade union by registering as a trade union under the trade union act. This is because the supremacy of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria 1999 as amended cannot be overemphasized. The constitutionally guaranteed right under section 40 to the person to assemble freely associate with other person and in particular to form or belong to any political party, trade union or any other association for the protection of rights implies that individuals are allowed to form an association for the protection of their rights or interests. It is immaterial whether or not the association form is registered as a trade union or not. Thus, an association registered under the Companies and Allied Matters Act is valid and can freely operate for the purpose of protecting the interests of its members as enshrined under the Constitution, which includes the rights of collection of dues from its members who have freely formed or joined the said association for the purpose of protecting their interests. In view of the foregoing analysis of both statutory and case law authority, I now open a careful perusal of the exhibit presented by the parties. It is my view that the right of workers or persons to form or join a trade union is granted by the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, specifically Section 40 of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, 1990, as amended. And as to acted within their right in forming an association to care for the welfare and interests of their members, even though not as a trade union. I'm going by the provision of section 12 of four of the Trade Union Act, Part T14, LFN 2004. It is unequivocally clear that membership of a trade union is voluntarily and no person or individual shall be forced to join any trade union or be victimized for refusing to join or remain a member of a trade union. In accordance with the provision of section five of four of the Labor Act, the deduction of check of dues by any trade union from the wages and salaries of an employee is not mandatory, but voluntary, based on agreement or consent of the employee. And there's no evidence of the fact that members of ASUS are members of the Nigerian Union of Teachers by assisted chapter, and no document to show that NUT obtained the consent of each member of ASUS, the deduction of a percentage as check of dues, and any deduction of check of dues and payment of same to the Nigerian Union of Teachers by a state chapter without consent from the persons whose wage is to be deducted in unity and same lacks validity or failure to fulfill the condition precedent prescribed by law. The Nigerian Union of Teachers by a state chapter has no power to grant waiver or accredit or regulate ASUS by a state or any other association. By the express provision of section two sub one, the, provi the provides for an association is not pro precluded from collecting dues or subscription from its members, provided that same is necessary for the purpose of getting the association registered as a trade union. Thus, ASUS by ASUS state may collect dues deducted from their members as may be necessary for the purpose of getting registered as a trade union. The constitutionally guaranteed right under section 40 to a person to assemble freely and associate with other person, and in particular to form or belong to any political party, trade union, or any other association for the protection of its interests implies that individuals are allowed to form an association for the protection of their interests. It is immaterial whether or not the association so formed is registered as a trade union or not. This leads to the inescapable conclusion that an association registered under the Companies and Allied Matters Act 2004 is valid and can freely operate for the purpose of protecting the interests of its members as enshrined under the constitution, which includes the right of collection of dues from its members who have freely formed and all joined the state association for the purpose of protecting their interests. In view of the foregoing facts as enumerated above, and by paragraph 10 of the defendant's counter affidavit in opposition to the claimant's affidavit in support of the resulting summon, while on the 2nd January 2020, the first set of defendants have unequivocally denied operating as a trade union, a fact which the claimant had failed to controvert in their further and better affidavit, which are within the same as admission portion to section 123 of the Evidence Act. It is my ardent belief that the claimants are not entitled to any of the reforms 
Therefore, the matter is here by dismiss. Parties are to bear their respective costs and judgment is here by entered accordingly. As the court pleases, my Lord, we are grateful. Yes. Uh, I, I think I have another matter. Yes, sir. We're here. Uh, Mr. Major. Mr. Major. Major. Yes, yes, sir. Is We're the other here. council? Uh, is the I other doubt. council with us? I doubt if he's on. I can't see any any other council on the platform. Okay, I think the major. You have to excuse me for for like an hour because we are having a virtual meeting with the President National Industrial Court of Nigeria now by 12 o'clock. Okay, sir. It's just that uh, the information came very uh, late yesterday. You say? It's okay, sir. It's just that the information got to me yesterday very late. And I had to, they told me it was 10 a.m. I had to suspend what I, 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 I said, was to do. Oh, so I'm, I'm very sorry. I'm very yes. sorry because I picked like three matters. I'm so very sorry. Just, just, just give me an hour. By, by one o'clock, I will ask them to call you so that we link again. We will just have a virtual meeting with the president by 12 o'clock. All right, sir. I, I hope to be back then. Okay. Please. All right. All right, sir. Any other person again, apart from Jomejo? Uh, with Jomejo, gift. Yes, sir. Uh, let, let, me just, let me just breeze into the meeting briefly, and then I think I will come back to you and then finish. OK, sir. OK, sir. No, I am. Uh, please, let me just breeze in. OK, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Hmm? Yeah, stay connected. Just. All right, sir. Yes, sir.
students. Yes, sir. Ah, uh, I did try to. You want to not talk now, but I did. I did. I did. I'm already here. Yeah. I'm not getting any audio. Who did post it? I'm not talking. Hmm. Okay.
Just gifts. Are you there? Gift measure. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> yes. Uh, let me quickly come back and deliver the before I go back to the meeting. Okay, so I think Jerry is on the line now. I can't see him anymore. Okay, good Jerry is there. Sir. Yeah, good afternoon, sir. Okay, Jerry. Yes, appearance. With profound respect, sir. My name is Keith Major. My humble appearance is for the claimants. Yes. Respectfully, sir. My name is Jerry of Moregi for the defendants. Okay, since uh, we, are, we are on Zoom, I think I'll just do the introductory, then some of the distant, then I'll, I'll go to the, 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 the decision part. Okay, sir. My Lord, I don't know because if... Uh, the papers are made. Okay, sir. My Lord, I don't know if I may... If, if it is... I don't know if we don't, uh, if we need to re-adopt our final addresses, if it's necessary. Yes, go ahead, please. Yes, sir. Um, go ahead. I don't know if I think the claimant, I don't know if it's the claimant or the defendant that should start. Well, uh, the, defendant, yes, the defendant or the defendant or now should start. Uh, the difficulty yes, I yes, have, sir. the difficulty I have, my lord, is that the processes are with my colleagues over there in uh, in Yenogua. Uh, except to say that uh, uh, just, just, just yes, uh, I adopt, I adopt. Uh, just make a sweeping statement that you are adopting. Yes, yes, sir. my lord, I adopt the final written address filed on behalf of the defendants, together with a reply on point of law. Okay. In order your lordship to uh, dismiss this, yes. sir, I'm grateful, sir. Okay. Yes, Mr. Gift. On behalf of the claimants, I adopt a written address dated the 10th of February, 2021 and filed on the 16th of February, 2021. And we humbly urge the Honorable Court to grant all the release. So may it please the court. The Clement Institute, I, I adopted all the process filed by both parties in support of their respective arguments. The Clement Institute this action via general form of complaint dated and filed on 23rd day of October, 2018 accompanied by a statement of facts, list of witnesses, witness deposition of oath, and copies of documents to be relied upon by the claimants. The claimants obtained leave to file the amended statement of facts, which was granted on the 17th day of November 2020. Before the amended statement of facts is dated 17th November 2020, and filed on the 18th day of November 2020. It's the claimant's claim against the defendants jointly and severally as follows. A declaration that the claimants are entitled to be paid remuneration or terminal benefits and allowances commensurate with that payable, whether employees of dependents performing similar functions have been regard to circumstances and conditions of their employment. A declaration that the claimants as staff of the dependents are entitled to written particulars of terms and employment embodied in the collective bargaining agreement having regards to circumstances of their employment and their budgets. Section 7, 11, and 11 of the Labor Act, laws of the Federation of Nigeria. A declaration that the claimants are also entitled from defendants the same medical range, shift, overtime, transport, feeding, leave allowances, bonuses by virtue of Section 13, 16, and 18 of the Labor Act, laws of the Federation of Nigeria, particulars which are specifically set out in the statement of facts supporting this case from date of filing this complaint to date of judgment and thereafter for the duration of the employment. A declaration that having regard to the nature of claimants' employment with dependents, they are entitled to be provided with an appropriate working kit for their safety and effective carrying out their duties. 
and order compelling the dependents to provide the claimants with written particulars of terms of their employment, as provided by Section 7 of the Labor Act of L1 Laws of the Federation of Nigeria 2004, and order compelling defendants to recall some claimants determinated their employment in violation of Section 11 of the Labor Act, Laws of the Federation of Nigeria 2004, injunction returning defendants, their servants, officers, or agents from however taking any step which will affect in any way or frustrate claimants' prosecution of this action for their employment, and in particular, from carrying out the threat of terminating their employment during the pendency of this action suit. An injunction restrained the defendants from promoting racism and engagement of foreigners to Jews ordinarily meant for Nigerians. And what of Section 10 of the Coastal and Inland Shipping Capital Act? A declaration that the practice of the defendants in giving their foreign workers preferential treatment over their Nigerian counterparts is discriminatory against the Nigerian workers and violates the provision of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria 1999 as amended, and order that the claimants are entitled to the recourse of this suit. Alternatively, in order that the claimants are entitled to monetary damages of 500 million naira for wrongful termination and all constructive dismissal of claimant during the pendency of the suit until the day judgment and thereafter until the judgment sum and accumulated interest are satisfied. 10% plus judgment interest per annum until the judgment sum is liquidated. In reaction to the complaint, the defendants filed their joint amended statement of defense and other accompanying documents dated 25 June 2019 and the claimant in response to the statement of defense filed their reply. Trial commenced in this suit on the 28th day of January 2019. The claimants in proof of their case call a total number of three witnesses. CW1, Captain Adani Riolo, adopted his written deposition and all, including his further written depositions, dated and filed on the 26th day of February 2019 as evidence in this suit and tendered seven documents, which were admitted and marked as exhibit CW001 to CW007, respectively. One Mr. John Okoro Adeyemi, who testified as CW2 and adopted his written deposition on oath dated 26 February 2019 as evidence in this suit. Mr. Yasser Peter, who is the first claimant in this suit, who testified as CW3 and adopted his written statement deposition on oath dated 8 January 2019 as evidence in this case, and tendered 13 documents which were admitted and marked as exhibit CW008, CW020, respectively. CW1 with the leave of this court was later recalled to testify on the 25th day of January 2019, where he adopted his further witness statement on oath on the 18th day of November 2020, 2020 as his further evidence in this case. All the claim and witnesses were duly cross-examined by the defendant counsel. Defendants opened their defense on the 13th day of May 2019 and call a total number of four witnesses in proof of their case. One was side, which could be testified as DW1. I adopted his written witness deposition on oath dated 5th December 2018 as evidence in this case, and tendered four documents, which are admitted and marked as experts DW4B001 to DW4B004, respectively. DW2 Monday of Fogo adopted his witness statement on all dated 26 November 2018 as his evidence of the suit and brought and sought to tender a document which was rejected by this honorable court on the ground that is a computer generated document failed to comply with the requirement of section 84 so 4A to C of the evidence act. And also the document sought to be tendered is an entry in a banker's book. We if it is a secondary evidence same must comply with the provision of section 90 sub 1E. I to four of the evidence act. DW further tender three documents which are admitted and marked as exhibit DW 4B005, DW 4B007, respectively. DW3, Crowder of KP adopted his witness statement of oath dated 5th December 2018 and was admitted as his evidence in this suit and tendered four documents which are admitted and marked as exhibit DW 4B008 A to C, DW. 4B0011, respectively. One orderly principal testified as DW4 and adopted his written statement on oath dated 25th June 2019. Evidence in this suit. Under cross examination, the claimant's counsel tendered a copy of the Constitution of the Maritime Workers Union of Nigeria, which was admitted and marked as exhibit DW0012. All the defendant witnesses were duly 
cross it, I mean, by the Clemens Council. At the close of the defendant's case, Clemens Council thought and obtained leave of this court to report CW1 and was further cross examined after giving his court evidence. The trial ended on the 23rd day of January 2021. The matter was adjourned for adoption of families. The final address were adopted and the court adjourned for judgment. Is yes, the brief case of the Clement case is that the staff of the defendants who are members of the Maritime Workers Union of Nigeria, that they have been employees of the defendants severally, different categories for a period ranging between one and four years for coming, which is including really transportation oil. The claimants are aware that since their employment, the defendants have failed and all refused to provide them with letters of employment despite repeated demands and promises to enhance their bargaining strength, they united by joining the Maritime Workers Union of Nigeria, which was uh, in a different Asimoku branch in Delta State. Defenders were not happy about this unionizing them to join the Maritime Workers Union of Nigeria. As a result, they refused to negotiate and sign the collective bargaining agreement with them as provided by the Labor Act. The claimant further about that non issuance of letter of employment and absence of collective bargaining agreement, account, uh, agreement subjected them to inhuman labor practices such as working 24 hours non stop, inadequate remuneration, as against what is obtainable in the industry, working in toxic and hazardous environment without necessary safety kit and racist abuses. As a result of this, the claimant was so sorrow to both the managing director of the first defendant. Director General of the Nigerian Maritime Administration Safety Management Agency in Massa protests the inhuman practices and racialized defendants rather than granting their demands sack all the claimants during the pendency of the suit. In that cross examination, Captain John Ade in CW informed the court that he is not a court captain for the defendant, only a captain operating one of the air devices owned by the second defendant. CW stated that the second claimant is an engineer. They had a badge while the first claimant is an oiler, the badge owned by the second claimant. And it is not true to say that the first and the second claimants were not employed by the second claimant as criminals. CW1 maintained that they don't have any contractual agreement for this court before the defendants are refused to give them any appointment letters. This is one of the reasons they are in court today. CW for that stated that CW001 is a list of some and not all the workers. It's not a permission to institute the action. All the workers, some and not all the workers. CW stated that it's aware, despite the fact that the first claimant and a crew member of one of the badges controlled by the second defendant, all happened before this issue was filed in the court. CW admitted that. Well, go. What is the series? Yes, I can lead to some of the series. Yes, I can lead to. It was confirmed that some of the engineers that took the missing oil from the lab were the vice fifteen of the first of the CW two. Not fighting anybody on board. CW three is a fita who is the claimant, the first claimant in this suit under cross examination. Informed this court that this suit was instituted on behalf of Maritime Workers Union of Nigeria, Smoko Branches. stated that there is a document to show that they have the authority to institute this action on behalf of the Smoko Branch. Not have the document for this on the court. CW3 informed the court that he does not know Mr. Journalists and C and Technical Service Limited, which is not Ovic Trust Service Limited. 
and stated that there was no contract between second defendant and uh, LSC and Tech Services Limited. They literally stated that the contract the defendant made him sign was not between him and all Victor Services Limited and maintain an account with them of salary that account initially paid by the second defendant. CW3 affirmed that they were forced to sign exhibit CW009 and admitted that exhibit CW008 is a decree of court. It is evident it's meant for the rating, and that is why the second defendant name is not there. CW3 admitted that exhibit CW007 is for the attendant list, and its name and that of the second defendant is not there. The issue of collective bargaining agreements and issue between the national body of maritime Casino of Nigeria. State body and the Asimoku branch and national body took up the issue in love with the state and the local branch. He stated that he's not an executive member of the Maritime Workers Union of Nigeria. First, it is a defendant case that the claimants have no contract of employment with the defendant jointly or separately. Second defendant between 2015 and 2017 entered various pre training agreements with independent contractors, duly licensed by Nigerian Maritime Administration and Safety Agency in the master to provide crew personnel for its vessels. Under its split, the defendants are about that by the mining contractual agreement between the second defendant and the secondary mining contractors. The claimants were engaged as the contractor of the secondary mining contractors. It's also the defendant's case that the second defendant did not restrain the claimants or any contract employee deployed to the second defendant from participating in any union activities. The defendant stated that the claimants sometimes in August 2017 remove our place as union officers of the Maritime Workers Union. When the Maritime Workers Union of Asimoku branch was able to have no confidence and really remove the claimant as senior leaders, the claimants do not have the authority and consent of members of the Maritime Workers Union of Nigeria, Asimoku JT Union branch, or the national body to institute this present action. It is a case of the defendant that the claimant contract of the claimant with the crew mining contractor has since expired before the institution of this suit following the conclusion of the preliminary investigation for alleged illegal sale of hydraulic oil with the first claimants was indicted by the investigative panel. BW1, Osai Victor Chukunfe, during cross-examination stated that his company, Obitros Global Resources Limited, registered in 2013, started doing business with the panel on the 15th day of December 2013. BW2, who is a crude money agent during cross examination? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Service Limited, Meta Global. W2 stated that he is not in the management of the defendants. The main purpose of Meta Global was for, is for mining agency, and same applies to Junilet C and Technical Service Limited. He stated that the contract between his company and the defendants started sometimes in 2016, and thereafter, the same was renewed. During cross examination, GW3 Crowder or Kepe informed this court that he's not a staff of Ovic Trust Limited, but worked for this first and second defendants as a consultant human resources. GW2 stated that he was a union leader of Maritime Workers Union in Nigeria, and he knows the claimants are members of the Maritime Workers Union. He stated that he participated in the meetings in which negotiations took place in 2018 for about six months, and the master was not involved in the negotiation of the collective bargaining agreement. W stated that his function includes supervision of human resource operation on both vessels as they reflect the defendants. EW4 or DLE principal in under cross examination stated that he has been working with Arimex Offshore Limited for three years as able seaman and became an executive member of the Maritime Workers Union of Nigeria as Moku branch in 2018. W4 informed the court that the claimants were removed as executive members of the Maritime Workers Union of Nigeria as Moku branch in 2017 but was not present when the claim was removed. He stated that he cannot remember the meeting held on the 16th of May, 2018, according to hotel in Lagos, and did not attend that meeting, and his name is not in that the list. Thereafter, the parties closed their case, and then transfers filed five. 
file final written addresses. Uh, give Major Angeli, I think I'll skip the final written addresses which you file, and I'll go to the, the, the decision of the court. Are you comfortable with that? As a copy, sir. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Yes, so let me rush to the to the decision part. So what, what, if you get the copy of the judgment, since you are the one who filed the written addresses, I have done that, I have evaluated the written addresses. The decision is this. I have gone through the evidence of the parties and submission of their respective counsel in this suit. Council have formulated several issues for determination in this matter. Pendant counsel raised four issues, namely A, B, C, and D. They seem to me to be a proliferation and which is why defendant counsel ended up lumping argument on these issues. Issues A and B together were argued together, while issues C and D were also compressed and argued together. The issues distilled on the other hands by the claimant's counsel are rather tangential and of not much premium on the contention and all contestation between the parties. From the evidence before me and going by the submission of counsel, the issue for Resolution are largely whether the claimants have the legal competence to institute this action. If the answer to that question is in the affirmative, then whether the claimants have established their case to be entitled to relief court. I shall therefore adopt for determination the two issues I have identified. On the issue of whether the claimants have the legal competence to institute this action, the claimants have instituted this action in a representative capacity. It is important to note from the on start, onset that this court being a labor court is very liberal and opposes technical justice over substantial justice. In its attempt at, at liberalizing access to justice, its rule of procedure are crafted in such a liberal and uninhibited manner that no strength or hurdle is placed in the way of a justice seeker. The rule requires no special requirement to bring in a representative action except as may be self-imposed. Order 13 Rule 11 of National Industrial Court of Nigeria Civil Procedure Rules 2017 provides, and I quote, where there are numerous persons having the same interest in one suit, one or more such person may sue or be sued on behalf of all for the benefit of all persons so interested, unquote. What a required of representative claimant in a representative action is just to provide proof that he or she has same interest with the other unnamed claimants. This reflects the philosophy behind the idea of a representative action. In Emenukwe and others against Annex and another citation provided, Okumumi Jujesie, as he then was referred to Augustine and Mosley and others against Chike Mbamalu and others, it's a Supreme Court decision where the Supreme Court held as follows, and I quote, the rule as to representative action was derived from the Court of Chancery in England which required the presence of all parties to an action so as to put an end to matters in controversy. See Anatobu against Attorney General East Central State of Nigeria. The rule has been described as a rule of convenience only. See Haimisu against Advani. The rule of convenience, it is a matter which ought not to be treated as rigid, but flexible tool of convenience in the administration of justice. Courts of law, should not myopically follow the rule rigidly and fall into a big ditch and find themselves in a state of mirage where it becomes impossible to address their steps to do justice in a given case. On the contrary, courts of law should invoke the rule where it is convenient to do so to assist them in doing justice in a given case. It is this aspect of doing justice in a case that vindicates the elements of convenience built into the rule. The rule is not cut and dry. After all, justice is paramount in the judicial process. It is essential of the process. In Wiki against Wiki, this court dealt extensively on the representative action. In this case, the court said the attitude of this court adopting matters of this nature is not a rigid one. It depends on the fact and circumstances of the case. If there is evidence that the parties appear to possess a representative capacity and the authority of those they represent, this court does not and will not upset a judgment of the lower court merely on the bare objection of failure to obtain approval of the court. See Guedu and others against power holding company of Nigeria on court. Claimants have claimed that they brought this action in representative. In paragraph 11 of amended statement of defense, defendant contention is that claimants do not have authority or consent of maritime union workers of Nigeria 
Asomoku branch in to the city. It is not in the place of the dependents to contend as they have done that, as they have done, that claimants do not have authority or consent of other person they claim to represent. The claimant has not stated that. They are members of Maritime Yokers Union of Nigeria, Asomoku branch. It is therefore not to serve as a shield or defense for defendant to challenge the representative capacity of the claimant. It is the person, it is the person claimant's claim to represent that can challenge them. And I so hope in Eco JSC against AG Kwara State, against uh, Kwara, against the large Honorable Ishola Lawa, the Supreme Court held and I quote, it will seem that from FCD, SPDC Nigeria Limited against Edamu Kwe, that the defendant is sued on action brought in a representative capacity but upon authorization of the other persons with common interest, has no low cost and right to object to the said representation, since he is not a member of the group of persons that authorize the name plenty. In Daba Hotel PLC against Itoga Supra, this court held this to say it is settled law that is only a member of a group or family or community who can dispute in Taiwan or challenge the proper representation or the capacity of which the plenty of plenty suit on court. Defendant counsel has conceded that the claimant satisfied the two strong conditions relating to capacity to institute a representative action, namely common interest and common grievance. The relief sought must in its nature be beneficial to all those the plaintiffs are representing. Surprisingly, defendant counsel made a somersault when he contended wrongly, in my, in my view, that persons who have been sacked by the defendant Cease to be in the employment of the defendant and so cannot benefit from the release. The argument is unfounded. Claimants are in this court to challenge the action of the defendants. It cannot there be logical that such persons who are challenging their sack, denial of entitlement, and last lack of respect for law cannot benefit from the action. Defendant conceded that claimants work for them, but that there was no contract of employment between them. This assertion they failed to substantiate. The Clement Council submitted that, and which I believe rightly so, that XBDWYB001 did not establish the claimants were employees of MS Obic Cross Global Resources Limited. Paragraph 3.1 and 3.2 at page 7 of Exhibit DWYB001 clearly stated duration of contract between the defendant and MS Obic Trust Global Resources Limited. The contract has since come to an end by a fluctuation of time. XBDWYB001 did not help the defendant case, it rather exposes their shenanigans. With what I have said mm -hmm. above, no, I have left with no option and to resolve the first issue in favor of the claimants. And I so hold that the claimant can institute this action in representative capacity. The next issue is whether the claimants have established their case to be entitled to the relief fund. It's tried law. That is the duty of a person who desires a court of law to give a judgment to him on illegal right is to provide evidence in proof of entitlement to such right. Section 131, subsection 1 of the Evidence Act, and the case of Modeli, Ashebi, and others against alleged risk of to law party and another, which is a Supreme Court decision, UBN against UCA called the limited. The court held, and I quote, the law is that. The trial court in its judgment should begin by considering the plaintiff's case and examine whether the plaintiff has laid evidence on all material issue of facts, which will, if accepted after evaluation, entitle him to succeed. Where the plaintiff has not laid evidence, where the evidence laid by him is so patently unsatisfactory, then he has not made out the case or laid evidence for the defendant to answer. In other words, the case may end at the first stage of considering the evidence led by the plaintiff without considering the case of the defendant. On court, claimants have claimed that they are staff of the defendants. The defendant refused to issue them letter of employment. I have held earlier in this judgment that the defendant did not deny knowing the claimants being persons who work for them. I have also held here that the contract between the defendants and MS Public Trust Global Resources Limited, which enabled the latter to engage claimants for service of defendants came to an end in 2018. But defendants still retain services of the claimants. Defendants cannot be allowed to deny the fact that claimants were not their staff. A, company, a contract of employment, like all other contracts, can be created in writing by conduct of parties or oral, see section 91 of the Labor Act. An employee is also who has entered into or works under a contract of employment. 
employment. CSC Limited against Aptropac, Yere Bendel Quits Limited against uh, Flower Mills, Joe Eager against Ezekiel Amakri and others, Chikuma against Ipalo, and host of other cases. And for them, Section 7 sub 1 of the Labor Act provides as follows, and I quote, not less than three months after the beginning of the worker's period of employment with an employer, the employer shall give to the worker a written statement specifying the name of the employer or group of employers and where the appropriate undertaking of which the worker is employed, and the name of address of the worker, and the place of engagement, and the nature of employment. And if the contract is for a fixed term, the date when the contract expires, the appropriate period of notice to be given by party wishing to terminate the contract due regard to, to section 11 of this act and the rate of wages and the method of calculation thereof and the manner of periodicity of payment of wages and any time and condition relating to hours of work holiday and holiday pay or incapacity of work due to sickness or injury including provisions for sick pay and any other special conditions of contract or court Applying the above provision of the law to the facts of this case, we come to irresistible conclusion that the claimant in this case approved the existence of contract of employment between them and the defendants, which though was not written, but entered into by conduct of the parties. I must state that the claimant cannot benefit from uh, the collective bargaining agreement because they are not parties to it. It was an agreement entered between the defendant and Maritime Worker Union of Nigeria, who are not parties in this matter. The doctrine of privity of contract is all about sanctity of contract between the parties to it. Persons who are not parties to a contract cannot be allowed to benefit from it or be bound by it, except where the contract so allows. Clement ought to have joined the Maritime Worker Union of Nigeria, which entered into the CBA on their behalf. This is a fatal omission to the case of the claimant. I must note that in contract of employment, like any other civil contract, Parties are at liberty to determine the contract. As such, the contract cannot dictate, the court cannot dictate terms of contract. It can also not, it can not also force or bind parties to remain in their contract. See Thomas was local government service commission. Temporary appointment can be justified as the law allows making of such appointment. The reason being that the power to make an appointment includes both the power to appoint for an indefinite period and the power to appoint for a fixed period. To therefore, within the power of the defendants to determine or terminate the employment of their employees. See Aquara Agu and others against Julius Space and PLC. However, when the contracts succeed, the dependent must respect the law of the land. In the final analysis, this should succeed in part and for the avoidance of doubts, prayer one, three, four, five, eight, and nine are granted, while prayer six and eleven are refused. Prayer 11, which is made in the alternative, can only be granted when the court fails to grant the main prayer. And I awarded the cost of 500,000 Naira as cost against the defendant in this regard. And judgment is here by entered accordingly. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lord, we thank the Lord for the well considered judgment. Yes. Yes, gift. Yes, gift. Let's go. Let's go first. Let's join the meeting. Yes, sir. Um, we, we, yes, sir. I don't know if my Lord could hear me. I don't know if my Lord can hear me. Thank 
Was five hundred thousand ever mm. has to be. Mm. Mm-hmm. 